All right. Hope you all had a good lunch. They brought me on again. They're like, you need to, you need to go, go up here again. They, gave me a, they kindly gave me a few minutes to just uh, go through some key slides. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just show you a couple of key slides here that I think will hopefully help illustrate some of the things that I was talking about before. So this is the force platform. Um, and I'm really going to be very, very, very quick here. We have a bunch of speakers in the back waiting. <clears throat> So our force platform has three components, the FAB, the linker, and the Exxon skipping PMO. I'll just reiterate, this is um, the Y-shaped figure here on the left-hand side is a monoclonal antibody. So at Dyne, what we've done is we've taken a, the top portion of that monoclonal antibody called an antigen binding fragment, an antibody fragment, or a FAB. And we've engineered it to bind tightly to something called the transferrin receptor one, or the TFR one. And this allows us to use this body's natural cell biology to drive the exon skipping PMO into the cell. And I'll illustrate that a little bit more in the next slide. We then have this linker that I talked about. It's clinically validated. It's been used in products that are on the market. And it really enables precise conjugation of the FAB to the antisense oligo or the PMO. And then we have a PMO that's designed to skip exon 51. And really, the force platform is designed to address the one big issue that you've heard about from many of the speakers prior to lunch, which is the ability to really drive the antisense oligo, the PMO, the exon skipping payload, into muscle cells, which has been one of the biggest limitations of current therapies. So this should also allow for increased time between doses. And as I said, the TFR receptor here, as you can see it on the cell membrane, the force conjugate binds to that TFR receptor, and it's dragged into the cell, develop, it forms an endosome, and then the PMO escapes from there and enters the nucleus to target the genetic basis of disease. We think this is going to be really important because it creates an opportunity to have durability of effect and a wide safety margin. I talked about some of the data from our uh, animal studies, and a couple of people came up to me and wanted me to reiterate this, and I'll just uh, quickly go through this. So this is the MDX mouse. We used a conjugate that addresses an exon 23 mutation because this mouse has an exon 23 mutation. And the key message here is we were very pleased to see the robust level of dystrophin restoration and distribution to the muscle membrane in the bottom half of the slide. About 90% in the diaphragm, 80% in the heart. Again, current modalities have had a lot of trouble getting into these, into these tissues. And then between 70 and 80% dystrophin positive fibers. And this is after a single dose of 30 mg per kg, and we looked at these animals four weeks later. And this data was presented recently at the MDA conference. And I'll just focus maybe very quickly on the right-hand panel. This D2 MDX mouse is that mouse model that has a severe DMD phenotype, if you will. More impaired muscle more advanced fibrosis. And what you can see here is, at baseline, what that fibrosis looks like at five weeks and also at 12 weeks. And over 22 weeks in the vehicle-treated animal, you can see the progression of fibrosis. When we gave our conjugate early, you can see that we were able to stem that progression of fibrosis to some extent. And when we gave the force even later in the lifespan of, the, of these mice, we can show that we're changing the trajectory of fibrosis. And this is in the quadriceps with repeat dosing. So very excited to be able to show this in this D2 MDX model. And, and um, not a lot of uh, literature is out there on this particular model with interventions. Um, I talked about the NHP or monkey studies. And again, this was important to do prior to going to the clinic to make sure we can actually affect robust exon skipping and have a favorable safety profile because we have patient safety first and foremost in our mind. And this is the uh, trial design. As I said, it's a three-year study. We're giving a drug in a multiple ascending dose period 20, over 24 weeks, every four weeks. So either Dyn251 or placebo. We have the open label extension period in which all patients receive active treatment for 24 weeks, getting it every four weeks again and then long-term extension for 96 weeks. And safety and tolerability and dystrophin are our primary endpoints. 
and I'm pleased to say that we'll have initial data presented in the second half of this year. We're also looking at upper limb function, lower limb function, cardiac function, and respiratory function, as well as quality of life. And this is just some of the inclusion exclusion criteria. You can go to the ct.gov uh, page to get all of the information on the trial criteria. Importantly, we're looking at four to 16 year olds who are both ambulant and non-ambulant. So a very wide group of patients that we're trying to serve in this study. And they can have gotten uh, exon skipping, prior exon skipping treatment. They just need to wash out uh, uh, within the last 12 weeks. And this is a global study. We have a number of sites inside of the US as well as outside of the US. And so we're continuing to open up sites here in the US. And again, the ct.gov page will give you all of that information. Again, thank you again for your time and attention and giving me a few more minutes up here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. Appreciate it. Excellent. Thanks, everyone, and welcome back from lunch. I'm glad we got to see the visual to Ash's slides. Um, we do have the second part of this um, session right now. We have a few more companies in the Exxon Skipping space that are going to give us information about their programs. So I'll welcome on. We're going to start with Mark Stahl, and we'll get the rest of the panelists up here. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Stahl. Uh, I'm a neurologist and I work in clinical development, uh, working on bringing new medicines uh, to, uh, to our, our patients that we hope to serve. These are our forward-looking statements. I think somewhere in here it says, I'm a doctor, not a fortune teller. <laughs> we at Avidity are committed to improving the lives of families who are affected by rare diseases by bringing RNA therapeutics to disease areas where they haven't really been applicable before. Um, and of course, that includes, first and foremost, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, this is the way we do that. We have a, a platform technology uh, called the antibody oligonucleotide conjugate, or the AOC. And our uh, technology, as it is applied to Duchenne, is to uh, improve the, uh, the efficiency of exon skipping by targeting muscle. These are the building blocks of the AOCs. As you, as you uh, are probably not surprised to hear, we have an antibody and an oligo. So the antibody is a naturally occurring protein. You're probably familiar with these. Uh, they, are, they are generated by your body uh, to help fight infections in, in the usual case. But uh, in drug development, we can use them to target uh, proteins. Uh, and, and they are very good for that because they uh, are, allow us to, uh, to stick something onto, onto something else. So allow us to, to specifically target, uh, uh, in, in this case, an oligo. The antibody is used to deliver the oligonucleotide, which is a short strand of DNA or RNA that you've already kind of heard about uh, during some of the talks here today. And of course, we use that to uh, achieve exon skipping. All right. The, uh, the way that this works is, uh, is at, diagrammed in this cartoon. So the antibody delivers the oligonucle oligonucleotide into muscle and heart tissue. Uh, the way that it does this is a little bit like uh, riding a bus. So the uh, oligo can be thought of as a passenger on the bus that is the antibody. And the antibody brings uh, the, the passenger to the, uh, to the bus stop, where, which is a, a very specific address uh, where the oligo gets out and goes to work. Of course, that work is the important job of increasing dystrophin protein. As you've heard, exon skipping is already a, an approach that we, know, that we know works. So what are we doing that's different? And really, as I mentioned, it's the, it's the delivery and the, the efficient uh, addition of oligonucleotide to the muscle. So uh, you know, the current approaches to, to achieving exon skipping are a little bit limited because, of course, uh, they don't get as much uh, antibody, or excuse me, they don't get as much oligonucleotide into the muscle, and they have to be dosed repeatedly uh, in, in, in a high frequency. But what we want to achieve is bringing more oligonucleotide into the muscle and reducing the frequency of dosing. So this is our approach. 
Uh, to kind of summarize the sort of overall picture, we have an antibody with multiple oligonucleotides attached to it. We bind to a, a, a protein at the surface of a muscle called the transferrin receptor 1. That pulls the, the oligonucleotide plus the antibody into the, into the muscle or the heart cell where the oligo is released. After that, the oligo is free to act on, on, the, uh, on the RNA that produces dystrophin, skipping the appropriate exon and achieving uh, increased dystrophin uh, protein levels. So the more oligo, the more exon skipping, the more dystrophin. Let me tell you a little bit about our, our basic science results that really got us excited about this approach. So here, uh, you can see that, that this is a, a test of our oligonucleotide just by itself, looking at, um, at muscle cells taken from uh, uh, DMD patients. And you can see here that the more oligo we're able to give, the more exon skipping we're able to achieve. Here, though, this is really the, where kind of the magic happens, right? So we, we used, did an experiment in which we took uh, an oligonucleotide that was just uh, by itself, an, an unconjugated naked oligonucleotide, and we looked at how much exon skipping we were able to get when we used uh, our oligo. And when we did that, we were able to see about, you know, something in the range of 1% uh, exon skipping. But when we attached the same amount of oligo to an antibody, we were able to improve that efficiency by 50-fold. So you can see here um, in the green, that's an AOC, compared to the blue that's an unconjugated oligo. That's very exciting, we, we, and, and of course that encouraged us to keep going. Naturally, exon skipping by itself is not so meaningful without having uh, the readout that's dystrophin. And that's really what we want. And so you can see here on, the, on this uh, left uh, panel, how much exon skipping we're able to get uh, with, with a single dose of our AOC. And on the right, you can see in multiple, uh, multiple tissues, including uh, the calf muscle, the diaphragm, and, the, and importantly, the heart, that we're able to achieve very high levels of dystrophin restoration after a single dose. So somewhere between uh, 10 and a little bit more than 30% exon skipping in, in skeletal muscles, and around 5% in heart after a single dose uh, without any, uh, any uh, uh, accumulation that we might expect from repeated dosing. And then finally, um, in, in terms of what we're able to see uh, in our preclinical studies is a really important uh, uh, slide that shows the distribution of that uh, dystrophin. This is a, another uh, advantage of the targeted delivery of our oligos. And you can see here um, that, that the, uh, on, the, on the far right panel where the uh, AOC is delivered, you can see a very homogeneous, even distribution of dystrophin throughout the muscle, meaning that the muscle should really function very well um, once, it's, uh, once it has its dystrophin uh, restored in this way. And, and it's not dependent on uh, diffusion from, from, the, uh, from the bloodstream. Okay. So that's great, and probably enough, uh, enough information about you know, treating muscular dystrophy in mice. But let's talk about in people. So I'm really happy and proud to, to be able to talk about our first uh, study uh, in people uh, for, for uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy called the EXPLORE44 study. This is a phase one, two study of our, our first drug called AOC1044, which, which uh, uh, means that it, it is a uh, 44 skipping uh, drug. And in this study, we are treating uh, healthy volunteers in the first part and participants who have DMD mutations that are amenable to skipping exon 44 in the second part. A few things uh, to note about this study. Uh, number one is, of course, that it was uh, designed in collaboration with many people in this room, um, patients, advocates, uh, expert physicians, uh, really taking as, as, as much uh, you know, uh, expert opinion into account as we could uh, in, in coming up with the best study that we could design. A few things about the, the, the study details. So uh, first, uh, it's, of course, as I, as I mentioned, a study of uh, uh, for designed for people who have uh, mutations that are amenable to skipping exon 44. Um, the first part of the study has 40 healthy volunteers. The second part of the study has 24 uh, uh, participants who have uh, DMD. We, we have a very, very wide uh, inclusion criteria. So we, have, uh, we, we are uh, including uh, people who have uh, both uh, ambulatory and non-ambulatory status and who are between the ages of 7 and 27. Uh, the first part of, the, of the, uh, this uh, study is placebo-controlled, but uh, as uh, kind of you've uh, heard be before in a couple of other study designs, 
we then move everyone who's uh, been in, in the first part of the study to an op what's called an open label extension where we're able to treat everyone, every participant in the study with, with active drug. Um, we uh, are treating, uh, it with our, our initial uh, study, treats patients uh, every six weeks. Uh, and and uh, the, of course, the uh, treatment is an uh, intravenous infusion. There are muscle uh, biopsies required during the study. The primary goals of the study, of course, are, are safety and tolerability, um, but then uh, it, at the same time, we'll be looking at many of the uh, you know, outcomes that you're very familiar with, uh, including the amount of dystrophin that we produce in muscle biopsy, and of course, some uh, of the uh, familiar uh, measures of muscle function and day-to-day -day activities and things like that in, in participants who have DMD. Here's a, a diagram of the study design. So you can see uh, we start at low, um, low uh, single doses, so that's a, 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 a multi, uh, single ascending dose uh, part in healthy volunteers. And then we use uh, those doses to reach uh, the dose levels that we expect to be uh, helpful for people who have, who have Duchenne. And so uh, the, once we reach the first dose level that's equivalent to, to a dose that we expect to be uh, efficacious in, 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 uh, in improving dystrophin levels in patients, um, we open up the, the patient portion of the study. Um, and, and as I mentioned uh, at the, at, in the previous slide, we are planning for uh, three doses in the, in the uh, patient portion of the study, uh, separated by six-week intervals. Um, I will note that uh, you know, this design, while it, it makes for a little bit of a complicated slide, we think it was really the most efficient way to uh, quickly get to, to patients while uh, you know, while we're still completing the uh, healthy volunteer portion of the study and uh, take the burden of, you know, low doses that we don't expect to really uh, be efficacious at increasing dystrophin away from, from patients and do some of the important uh, early safety work uh, in, in people uh, who, who uh, are healthy volunteers. So really, overall, it's our way of getting to patients as fast as we possibly can. A few last points. This study was really designed to enhance the patient experience, so we made as many visits uh, home health as, as we possibly could. We have a travel concierge who helps set up travel and some reimbursement uh, for, for uh, participants who might have any, any issues getting to uh, our sites. Um, and of course, uh, you know, we, we uh, are uh, dedicated to partnering with, with the people who are here, with, with uh, advocacy groups like Cure Duchenne in, um, in, in improving their, their lives through having uh, efficacious medicines that are delivered in a way that, that is compatible with, with, their, with their lives. And so um, a few key takeaways, uh, we, are, we have a, a drug designed to treat the underlying uh, dystrophin uh, deficiency in, in muscle and in heart. We see really nice improvement in, in dystrophin in, in our um, preclinical models. The EXPLORE44 trial is ongoing in the, in the healthy volunteer portion, and the part uh, B that includes uh, patients is planning uh, to begin enrollment later uh, this year. The, the uh, uh, treatment is an intravenous drug uh, given uh, once every six weeks, and of course we are partnering with the advocacy community to get you more information as it becomes available. Finally, this is my favorite slide, which has these uh, incredibly dedicated folks, many of whom are here today, um, who are working every day to, to uh, bring drugs to the Duchenne community. We'd love to hear from you, so please feel free to contact us uh, at the email address that's on the bottom of the slide, patients at avididybio.com. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay. It works. Uh, hello, good afternoon everyone. Thanks for welcoming me today. My name is Dania Porco, and I'm a director in our early clinical development group at Biomarin. I'm really honored to be here to share with you information about our Exxon 51 skipping program for Duchenne on behalf of Biomarin and uh, my neuromuscular team, who, some of whom are here today. Um, so today I'll, I'll go through sort of three key topics. One is the research behind our uh, potential new treatment for Duchenne, results from our um, non-clinical studies, and potential future clinical trial of BMN351. Before I do that, I wanted to give you just a bit of information about Biomarin for those of you who may not be familiar. Patients are extremely important to us at Biomarin, and we come to work every day with a real sense of urgency to develop best and first-in-class medicines for patients. And we think about the patient voice as we design our clinical development programs and our clinical trials, 
and take into consideration and feedback from patient advocacy groups such as Curity Shen and the patient community. At Biomarin, we focus on what we call our core four attributes, and that's really genetic conditions that are targeted to make treatments that are accessible and transformational for patients. And you'll see that reflected in our Duchenne program. And the goal of that program was really to improve on the safety profile and also demonstrate significant levels of dystrophin production above 10%. As with my other colleagues, we also have four lurking statements since we're a public company, so you can read those at your leisure. And now I'll talk about our research for this potential treatment for Duchenne. So for those that don't know, back in 2014, Biomarin acquired the company that was developing Drysopersin. That's actually where I used to work. <clears throat> we made the difficult decision in 2016 to discontinue that program after discussions with the Food and Drug Administration as well as the European Medicines Agency. However, since that time, we've been working really hard to think about that molecule and how we could improve that molecule to be able to transform patient lives. And so um, my colleagues in, in research have gone back to the drawing board to think about how can we better increase dystrophin production in a way that's safer for patients. And so in 2021, we announced our new uh, investigational program, BMN351, which is an antisense oligonucleotide for exon 51 skipping. We're currently in discussions with regulatory agencies, clinical trial sites, key opinion leaders, patient advocacy groups, et cetera, to, to help us think about how we design a future trial for patients with Duchenne. So BMN351 is an antisense oligonucleotide. As I mentioned, it's currently being studied in the lab and in animals. Um, we're, we have not yet begun clinical trials in patients, and it's not yet approved for use in patients. As I mentioned, it, it would be a potential treatment for those amenable to exon 51 skipping. And different from our drysoperson program, it would be administered intravenously or through a vein. And what's really unique about BMN351 is that we've taken a look at the structure of drysoperson and we've made chemical modifications to that structure. And that really allows um, the compound to, we hope and we, we think, potentially be more um, uh, stable and therefore reduce the potential for adverse side effects. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've taken a look at this, the target site and Lan introduced um, the, the concept and theory of exon skipping. Um, and so we've actually found a newer site that we think will actually help increase the amount of exon skipping and therefore translate into increased dystrophin production and hopefully a potential clinically meaningful outcome. So now I'll share some of those animal studies. And um, our investigators looked at uh, lots of things, but I'm gonna share some of those today um, in our uh, mouse studies. So what they did was add a human Duchenne gene to mice to genetically modify them to have Duchenne. And two of the studies that I'll share today, in the first one, they looked at many different ASOs, antisense oligonucleotides, that were given weekly for 12 weeks. In a different and separate study, they gave BMN 351 weekly for about five months, and then looked at mice one and three months after their last dose, uh, and looked at different dose levels. So on this slide, you'll see on the left-hand side the percent exon skipping, and on the bottom are lots of different molecules uh, that were studied. And what we can see is that when we make those chemical modifications I referred to earlier, that we do have an increase in exon skipping about 27 times more than what we saw with drysoperson. However, when we target that new site that I mentioned, we see this much greater exon 51 skipping, about 120 times fold more than what we saw in drysoperson in mice. So with that, we wanted to look at, okay, well, what does that do for dystrophin production? So we looked at different muscle tissues, and here I have the thigh and the heart muscle. And what we can see is that in these mice that were dosed weekly for about five months, both one month and three months after dosing was stopped, we have increased levels of dystrophin production compared to animals that were not treated. And the light pink is the low dose, and the darker pink or purple um, is the high dose. And you can see a nice dose response, which means the more 
um, BMN351 that was given, the more dystrophin that we see being produced. And what's really exciting about this is that we see this both in the thigh and the heart muscle, which we know is a, a big area of unmet medical need for patients with Duchenne. And what's also really great about this data is that it shows that even after we discontinued the dose, there's still this increase in dystrophin production, which we know does take time to accumulate. And then the last piece that we looked at in the mice was how does this impact their function, right? Because that's really why we're here. And that's what we want to be able to, to transform patients' lives. <clears throat> so we took a look at those same mice that were treated for about five months. And we um, looked at this score. It's called a motivator score. And this is really a test of how well the animals can move and walk. A higher score means that they can't move and walk very well. So you can see in the blue line, the, animal, the animals that were not treated with BMN351, their score increased over time, which meant that they were worsening. However, in the, the two groups here that were treated with BMN351, there appears to be um, a stabilization or even potentially an improvement um, over time in their motivator score. And we can see that the effect of that improvement lasted at least three months after their last treatment. So that was the efficacy, or how well does the drug work? And now to, to share just a bit about safety. So um, BMN351 is an ASO, as mentioned, and the ASO as a class do have certain side effects that are well known. And those relate to kidney damage, liver damage, slow blood clotting, low platelet counts, which helps, helps blood clot, and then pain, itching, swelling, or redness where the injection was given when given under the skin. And what we saw in our animal studies were similar safety results to those that I just shared in the previous slide. And we're also studying BMN351 in monkeys to also understand the effect, the, the safety profile. And what we'll do next um, is understand how this works in the liver, kidneys, and blood in future studies of BMN351. So what could a future clinical trial look like? Well, this is still under discussion, as I mentioned previously. But some initial thoughts are this would be about 18 boys with Duchenne. They would have to have a mutation amenable to exon 51 skipping between the age of 4 to 10 and have not received gene therapy previously. They would need to be ambulatory and willing to receive an IV infusion about once a week. They would receive many different doses of BMN351 during that study, and that study would last about a year with the opportunity to have future uh, treatment. So I just wanted to thank you again for your time today. Um, certainly around for questions if there are any. You can also go to our website under the patient advocacy section. And our medical information, um, information is here via email or phone if you'd like to call. Thanks again. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Narissa Crayer from Entrada Therapeutics. Thank you so much for welcoming Entrada here today. It's really my pleasure to be back at Cure Duchenne Futures, and I look forward to sharing Entrada's science with you. So today we'll be talking about our endosomal escape vehicle platform. We call those EEVs for reference. We're also a public company, and thus the disclaimers, which are available on our website, who is Entrada Therapeutics for those of you who don't know us? We're a company that's committed to partnering with patient communities to ensure that your perspectives are built into everything we do at the company. Our culture is built on prioritizing exactly that. We're a company of about 130 people based in the Boston area, and we're very proud of the fact that our company represents what patients in the patient community look like, meaning that we have about 52% of our employees that identify as women, and about half of our employees identify as racially and ethnically diverse. 
Our commitment to the Duchenne community we take very seriously, and it is to work with you to bring innovative therapies to people and families living with Duchenne. I think one great example of that is the decision to go into the Exxon 44 skipping population first. That decision was made with input from this community, and we will continue to seek your input throughout our development path. So what are we trying to accomplish at Entrada? We in the drug development industry have a major issue with getting drugs into cells. And that's where many of the disease-causing targets exist, about 75% of them, in fact. And so we need to look for ways to more effectively get drug into cell and also to help it not be cleared from the cell before it can reach its actual target. So that's what our EEV platform was designed to do. And schematically, what you can see on this slide is we are targeting both of those problems. So we're able to get more drug into cells by conjugating, in this case, the exon skipping portion, or oligonucleotide, to the EEV. We get about 50% more uptake than if it were not conjugated. And then also to allow it to escape something called the early endosome. And the endosome is part of that clearing system I was talking about. If drugs get stuck there, they can't actually get to the nucleus, which is our target related to Duchenne. So I'm gonna move into some of our data. This is just a very quick snapshot of some data for our ENTR 60144 program. Um, at the end of the presentation, there's a QR code that will take you to many of our presentations and much more data if you're interested. So here on both graphs, I'm showing data from non-human primates where we've delivered a single intravenous dose of ENTR 60144. And on the left-hand panel, what you can see is significantly high exon skipping in many different skeletal muscle tissues, but importantly, also the diaphragm and the heart. And the diaphragm and the heart, of course, are very important for cardiorespiratory function, one of the key critical issues for Duchenne patients. On the right-hand side, you can see another experiment we did where we actually measured the duration of exon skipping. And so we see exon skipping out as far as about um, seven weeks if you look at exon skipping over time measured with serial biopsy. And I'll tell you on the next slide why we feel like that's so important. So putting it all together again, not showing you all of this data, but we have effective exon skipping in both skeletal muscle, heart, and diaphragm. We have robust dystrophin production, which we've measured in patient cells, as well as that prolonged duration of exon skipping, which we believe translates into making our therapy something that we can deliver every six weeks. And so very different than the products that are currently available, where you receive an intravenous infusion every week, we're talking about something that could really transform the lives of patients with Duchenne, not only from an efficacy perspective potentially, but also from a lifestyle perspective as well. Earlier this year, we also announced we have a 45 skipping program that's called ENTR 60145. And the data here are from Duchenne patient cells um, on, on both sides of the slide. On the left-hand slide, we measured in skeletal muscle cells both exon skipping as well as dystrophin production. And so you can see again in a dose-dependent fashion very high exon skipping up to 100% at higher doses. And that translates into very high dystrophin production as well. On the right-hand side, we're looking at dystrophin production in the heart. Again, going back to the 44 data, the heart is a very important target for us to hit. And so being able to see dystrophin production in the cardiac muscle is very important to us. So if I take you through from the um, left-hand side, you see healthy cells, so making lots of um, red dystrophin protein. 
and then in a dose-dependent fashion, again, stepping you through no dose or placebo, you don't see the red protein dystrophin being produced. And then as you move through into higher doses, you see lots and lots more dystrophin being produced. So very exciting data for us from our 45 program as well. So in summary, we're advancing new therapeutic options uh, for patients living with Exxon 44 and Exxon 45 skip amenable Duchenne. I think many of you may have heard the 44 program was put on clinical hold after we filed our investigational new drug. We're working diligently at the company to move that program forward and are committed to providing updates as we have more conversations. Um, we are committed to moving that program into the clinic this year. Our 45 program, we have an IND, uh, IND filing plan for the second half of 24, and we look forward to sharing more information on that clinical development plan in the near future. And also exciting to share that we also have discovery efforts in both Exxon 50 as well as 51. And as you saw Leanna share earlier today, that Exxon 50 skip amenable population is one, just like the 44 population, there are no drugs approved. And so that weighs on our decision making as we think about where can we have the most impact for patients and families with Duchenne at Entrada Therapeutics. So from our whole team from Boston, thank you very much for having us. Um, myself, as well as Reagan Sherman, our head of patient advocacy are here. We have a booth and there's more information about the company if you click on the QR code. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jane Lurkendale. I'm the VP of Clinical Science at Gen. Big thank you to Kyo Shen for inviting us to speak here. And also a big thank you to Cure Duchenne for the fact that we are here as Cure Duchenne Ventures funded PepGen in the early, uh, um, early days of our company. And without that funding, we wouldn't be where we are today or sharing this really exciting data with you. So I'm here to tell you primarily about our phase one um, trial in Exxon 51, skippable Duchenne muscular dystrophy with our lead compound, EDO51. At the end, I'll touch on some of our other programs also in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Disclaimers, forward-looking statements, we all have them. I know they're boring. <laughs> this slide, I think we've seen that with all of our competitors and all, um, many of these other compounds, the problem with exon skipping drugs is not that they don't work. It's getting enough of them into the cell and into the nucleus. They can really do their job to the best of their potential. Our EDO, or enhanced delivery oligonucleotides, solve that problem. What we have is a small um, peptide that we attach to the oligo, which allows it to get into the cell and into the nucleus at very, very high levels. And we see this in skeletal muscle, we see this in smooth muscle, so that's things like the gut, and we see it in the heart. I'm not gonna share all that data today, we've shown it in the past. Feel free to come to our booth if you'd like to see that data, we get really good delivery, and I'm not gonna show it to you. So this slide is gonna summarize many years of preclinical data because um, I'm really only going to show one slide with animal data on it. Starting at the smallest in mice, we see extremely high levels of exon skipping and high levels of dystrophin production. Reductions in CK even after a single dose. We've done single and repeat dose studies there. And non-human primates, again, we've seen extremely high levels of exon sk uh, skipping at tolerable doses, and that's with our clinical candidate. But what I am going to be talking about is our phase one study in healthy volunteers that read out at the end of last year, because I think it's really important to understand how these, the, um, how these potential therapeutics work in humans, and we're really excited by the data we saw in the study. Here's my one monkey slide. <laughs> this, is a, uh, this is from one of our many studies that we did in non-human primates. This was a repeat dose study. You can see that teal, Green, a greenish barrel at the top, that is EDO51, our clinical candidate. And you can see with repeating doses, we saw increasing levels of exon skipping dose by dose. The reddish line is a, is a competitive drug. Um, it's, a, it's not a naked oligo, it is actually another um, PPMO or peptide linked um, PMO molecule. It also shows increasing levels of exon skipping, but at every dose we've tested, we show superior levels of exon skipping and superior dystrophin production. So that's my one token animal slide. Let's talk about people. The first question people ask is, why did you do a healthy volunteer study in the first place? Well, 
at Pep Gym, we really believe we work for the community, for the, for the boys, for the young men, for the families. And we spent a lot of time talking to you guys about what's important. And everyone told us, not surprisingly, I would hate my, my kid to go into a study at, at a dose so low that where they're not going to see benefit. And they said so they don't like to have biopsies, they don't want to be in the clinic for too long. We knew we really wanted to understand the safety and potential of efficacy for our drug before we went into young men with Duchenne. So we did a safety volunteer study. These very kind, healthy adult volunteers stayed in clinic for 10 days so we could learn as much about them as possible. They came back a month later, they had two biopsies. We learned a huge amount from the study. It was a single ascending dose study, so we went from one to 15 mg per kg. It was placebo controlled. We took biopsies at day 10, we took biopsies at day 28, and these poor men, took so, we took so much of their blood to find out what was going, going on and really understand our drug. I thank these guys. What did we learn? We, in terms of target engagement, we saw the highest level of, of exon 51 skipping that's been observed in a single dose study in humans. In terms of delivery, we saw the highest levels of oligonucleotide delivery that have been seen following a single dose in humans and the drug was generally well tolerated. But it's easy for me to say that. Let me share some of this data with you. So this is just a, a summary of our safety and tolerability data. Importantly, everyone finished the study, there were no discontinuations. We did have adverse events, find me a study that doesn't have adverse events, but in most cases they were mild and resolved without intervention. At 15 mg per kg, which is our highest dose, we did see transient reversible changes in what are called kidney biomarkers. These are things in the blood that change when there's the potential for changes in the kidney. These resolved, they were very transient. In most cases, when I say transient, they were resolved within a day or two. We had one man who we sent to the hospital because his levels were higher than everyone. He received some fluids and went back to the phase one unit and, fin and finished the study. We did see two people with mild to moderate changes in blood magnesium. Again, no clinical, cl clinical signs or anything that the person felt. These are things that we will keep a careful eye on as we go through. And given the extremely transient nature of them, we might not have even detected them if we hadn't done this very detailed study. But what do people care about? People really care about, is this gonna work? This is how much oligonucleotide, this is how much exon skipping drug we got into the biceps muscle. Remember, we asked these healthy volunteers to give us, to take a biopsy on day 10 and day 28. And I think this is really exciting data. You can see, Dose dependently, we saw increases in, exon, oh, I'm sorry, increases in drug concentration in the muscle, and we saw high levels of both day 10 and day 28, which supports at least a frequency of monthly dosing as we move into young men with Duchenne. In terms of exon skipping, this is by DDPCR. It's a different technique than was used in our monkey study, so the numbers are lower, but again, you can see this increase in exon skipping with dose. It persists over the full month after, do, after that single dose, it persists, our oligo remains in, the, remains in the muscle tissue. We see, see exon skipping remaining in the muscle tissue for over a month. We believe, based on this data, that we're going to see accumulation of exon sk skipping and accumulation of dystrophin after repeat dosing when we move into multiple ascending dose studies. This was really exciting, and these are the highest levels of exon skipping that have been seen after a single dose study in humans. So we were really encouraged by this. Based on that, we want to go into repeat dose studies. This is going back to that safety, safety thing we, uh, we talked about, this change on a biomarker in the blood after a single dose. Again, we're back to monkeys here, where we did, have done a repeat dose study. And what I want you to notice is after the first dose in monkeys, we saw this transient change in this blood marker, but we didn't see it after the second or third dose. And this has been repeated in several studies now. So we, we really believe that our drug will be, will be tolerable as we move into multiple dose studies. Furthermore, again, this is a little bit of monkey data. On the left-hand side, you can see our healthy volunteer study where we saw a one to one and a half percent exon skipping by DDPCR at 10 mg per kg. Then we went back and it looked at our repeat monkey studies where we used the same kind, same assay, where at 20 mg per kg, we were seeing about two and a half percent exon skipping after a single dose. After four doses, that was 35% exon skipping. We know this accumulates with repeat dosing. We've seen it in mice, we've seen it in monkeys, and we're, we hope to see it in humans soon. So where do we go with all that data? We, we're gonna start a repeat dose study in boys and young men with Duchenne this year. We, we believe our data supports monthly dosing. We believe that this will be tolerable, and we're hoping we'll be able to start this, do, this study at a dose 
where um, we're going to have genuine effects. So I can't tell you too much about, uh, about our clinical studies, but I can tell you that we're going to have two clinical trials starting in people with Duchenne this year. The Connect 1 EDO51 study will be a phase two fairly small open label multiple ascending dose study, which will be based in Canada. And the Connect 2 will be a larger global randomized double blind placebo controlled study. Both of these are planned to start this year. I know the question everyone, everyone wants to ask is, who, who's going to be involved? Where are, you, where are your sites going to be? Can my kid be involved? I can't tell you that yet. But as soon as we have that information, we will share that with the community. We will tell you more about these studies as we go, go through the regulatory process. We will be dosing monthly, and we really do believe that our data suggests we will produce significant amounts of dystrophin based on what we've seen in monkeys and what we saw in this Healthy Volunteers study. So we're really excited to be working with you, the community, as we move forward on Exxon 51. We recognize not everybody has an Exxon 51 skippable mutation. We have studies, um, we have monkey studies in Exxon 53 ongoing. We have uh, early cell data in Exxon 44 and 45. All of these we're seeing extremely high levels of Exxon skipping too. And we recognize there are lots of other mutations behind that. We're really excited about our program. We've been working with you all the way through from the very, very early days as we designed our first clinical experiments. We want to work with you as we move forwards boards with our next studies and beyond. If you have questions, if, you're, if you want to learn more, I have a booth next door. Email us at community at pepgen.com. I forgot to put that on my slide. This is our very small company at a picnic. Um, huge thank yous to our volunteers. Huge thank yous to our community advisors who have been with me every step along the way. I don't know how many people I have called on a regular basis to say, hey, we're thinking about this versus that in our next trial. What do you think? And all of that comes from you guys in the community. We do this for you, we do this with you, and I really hope we will be making a difference for you. Thank you. Everyone, thanks so much for the kind invitation to present our very exciting uh, data from our phase one N531 of WAVE. Uh, I'm Mike Tillinger, I joined WAVE at the end of 2022, so I'm very new to the Duchesne uh, community. Um, this is the forward-looking statement that you've seen now from everyone, and if you know the differences between the slides, you get a prize. This is just to say that me and some of my colleagues are working at WAVE, uh, and WAVE is a small but growing biotech company in the Boston area that is focused on genetic medicine, very, very patient-centric, as you can see from the various activities with different patient groups. Uh, and as many of you know, WAVE had a prior generation Exxon 51 skipping a, a oligonucleotide called suvadercin that has failed to demonstrate in clinical studies entry into muscle. And as a result, uh, the chemistry has been changed. So what you see here on the left is the backbone with um, phosphate and oxygen, which is the natural way. Uh, in the middle, you see uh, phosphor and sulfate, uh, and the new backbone includes nitrogen as well, and the PN backbone creates a neutral charge, which has been demonstrated in animal models and in humans, as I will show you shortly, to have a better entry into muscles, and not just muscles, but also diaphragm and heart as well. And what you see here is just one animal model. This is a double knockout mice. Uh, the graph that you see is called a Kaplan-Meier graph. What you see on the x-axis is time, and what you see on the y-axis is the percent of survivability. So the more the graph is to the right, the better survivability there is. Uh, the red line represents a placebo. The blue line represents the previous generation Suvadelsin-like molecule. And what you see in the top line, in green and dotted blue lines, are two dosages of N531-like uh, molecule in mice, and what you can see is that in this model, uh, this molecule had the mice survive until the end of the study. And this, coupled with many other studies that I don't have time to get into, led to the design of a first-in-human study. Uh, in the single ascending dose, three boys were treated with one, three, six, and 10 milligrams per kilo and based on pharmacokinetics and safety data, 10 milligrams per kilo was chosen for a multi-dose study where those same three patients received 
three dosages, one at week zero, one at week two, and one at week four of 10 milligrams per kilo. And then two weeks following the last dose, they were biopsied. The primary endpoint was safety, but obviously we looked at pharmacodynamics parameters such as muscle concentration and exon skipping. Here are the baseline characteristics. You can see the boys ranged in age from eight to 10. Uh, they all had different mutations, but all amenable to exon 53 skipping. Uh, they were all ambulatory, although one of them had a low NSAA at baseline. And this is the uh, very encouraging data that we are happy to share. So as you can see, there was a wide range of muscle concentration, but the average was 42 micrograms per gram. And despite the various muscle concentration and various mutations, we had quite consistent exon skipping with a mean of 53%. Uh, the dystrophin level was 0.27, which is be below the uh, level of quantification. The other exciting uh, data that came out of this was at this dose of 10 milligram per kilos, the half-life was 25 days which means we can continue dosing patients at bi-weekly intervals and hopefully in the future make that interval even less frequent. Uh, safety was very well tolerated. There was only one mild side effect of COVID-19. The related side effects, headache and rash, were very short-lived and, and all mild. There were no serious adverse events. And we found that this safety profile, but mostly the 53% uh, exon skipping, especially so shortly after such a short duration of treatment, were very, very encouraging. And we are now in the process of expanding the study to include up to 10 patients uh, who will be treated bi-weekly for a year. We will take biopsies at six and 12 months. And in addition to PK and safety, we will collect several functional outcomes. Uh, we do want to thank the community because we have been in uh, constant uh, dialogue and listening and implementing as much as possible from input we have received. So for example, this is an open label, there's no placebo. We are minimizing the number of biopsies. We are including non-ambulatory patients. Uh, we are uh, allowing optional home nursing where and when it is feasible and we would really relish the opportunity to continue this fruitful dialogue with the community. Uh, we do want to acknowledge the participants first and foremost, uh, but also the families. We know what a tremendous burden this is for families and patients to participate in these studies. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the dedication of our investigators and my colleagues at Friend at uh, Way for furthering the science and for their dedication to uh, find a cure for this treatment. Thank you very much. We have a booth for and address any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So actually, we a little change of plans. We've actually decided since there's so many different companies in the RNA and, and exon skipping world that we're going to skip the audience Q&A, but we've talked to the people on the first part and on the second part, and it looks like you're willing to answer some questions from, from families in our exhibitor showcase at the booth with your teams. I know that um, you know, we're looking at all different mutations, right? So we wanna make sure we're answering specific questions. So we're gonna move on to our next session, and please, just a big thank you to the, to the speakers today. Thank Excellent. you. You can go right.